Today we're joined by a longtime friend of the podcast, Eve Castle. Eve, welcome to P Towers and the Poetry P Podcast. Thank you, Patricia. I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> glad to have you, because last year you came to me and suggested a topic, <laughs> inner and outer weather. And uh, I really don't think you expected me to turn it back on you and say, please, could you do the presentation? Right. I. Uh, it was a surprise, but I'm here. And uh, I was listening to your Series 4, Episode 7 of the podcast, and it was featuring Randy Brooks. And he and you discussed what he called inner and outer weather. And I found it really intriguing. And then he shared a Robert Frost poem called Tree at My Window. And so Robert Frost is addressing the tree. But tree, I have seen you taken and tossed. And if you have seen me when I slept, you have seen me when I have taken and swept and all but lost. That day she put our heads together, fate had her imagination about her. Your head so much concerned with outer, mine with inner weather. I think it's lovely. And I thought it would make a good theme, the um, outer weather, the seasonal or the kigo and the inner weather, um, emotion, passion, thought, whatever's going on inside of a person. And so I mentioned it to you and here I am. And then I also wanted to remind everyone about something that you shared in um, series two, episode seven. Um, you indicated, I think there's a fine line between the use of aesthetics to create emotive responses, joy or sadness, and indulging in your own mood. And then you shared a quote, which you've put on the screen by Otsuji, and I'll read that as well. When one is overwhelmed by sorrow, that sorrow cannot produce a haiku. When one is joyful and immersed in happiness, that feeling cannot produce a haiku. And so I think it's basically saying you have to kind of back off of that um, to be able to do something that is a little more subtle and speaks, I guess, to a broader group of people. So I was trying to find examples of inner outer weather in haiku where the poet managed their emotive response so that it wouldn't seem self-indulgent and where they've e managed their ego. I also noted that in some cases, the weather created the emotive response and in others, the weather was a reflection of the poet's inner emotion. So I found it very interesting and I thought it was a good topic, maybe. <laughs> well, I think it's a good topic, Eve. Shall we, shall we have a look at some of the haiku and see what everybody else thinks? Springtime, the song within bird song. Springtime. The song within bird song, Ed Bremson, Songbirds Online, the United Haiku and Tankit Society. So obviously this is a spring haiku. I it has it's followed by an ellipsis. From this from reading, I felt like he was sharing how he was feeling inside. The song within the bird song was reflective, reflective of how he was feeling. I think that within is kind of a cutting word. You probably could be a better judge of that, uh, but it opens the poem's meaning. Specifically, the bird song has influenced his inner weather, but it's also a reflection because he's observing the springtime. So it's kind of both, I think. I was interested that you picked within as the um, as a cutting word, and I, I hadn't tweaked that one on the first reading of it, but yeah. I think it actually has a couple of cuttings. So you've got the cut after springtime, and you're right. right, there is that little cut there with within. And you're right, mm -hmm. it does open the whole, I was going to say song, because it's so joyous, mm -hmm. the, the the poem uh, at that point. I think it does all things that you were looking for, really. There's no real no ego in this this poem. Mm -hmm. is there? The, the poet yeah. is clearly there, but, you know, he's not in your face. It reflects, I think, some emotion that he's feeling. But also, it could be that there's just the joy of spring is influencing the way he's writing as well. So I think it's a great example to kick off our presentation here today. I, th I think so too. Kayak River Tour, the Kingfisher everyone else saw. Kayak River Tour, the Kingfisher everyone else saw. Lee Hudspeth, Wales Haiku Journal, Autumn 2022. From my perspective, I assumed that it was disappointment from the near miss of seeing the awesome kingfisher if you've ever seen one they're awesome um and so that's how i interpreted the this wonderful haiku i considered river tour 
a summer Kigo. So I, I think it's summer here and um, I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the river tour does suggest the summer. I agree with you. There is definitely some disappointment sort of, um, <laughs> it's a happy disappointment though, because I think because of the use of summer, we're mm -hmm. feeling that Lee is enjoying what he's up to, but just, oh, you know, with everything that's going on, the distractions all around him, he's missed yeah. He's missed the main event, bless him. Um, so I, I sent him a little note and said, would you like to say something about this? And um, I'll read you what he sent back. Okay. The poem's main expression is surprise disappointment, just like you thought mm -hmm. really there, Eve. <laughs> he said he was actually happy being on the river, but also busy getting his paddling rhythm, meeting the other people on the tour, taking in the surroundings, feeling cooled by the river on a hot summer afternoon, listening to our guide's instructions. I'll call it a state of happy distraction and engagement, he says. <laughs> but he did intend to primarily convey that feeling of, that we've all had of, oh, mm -hmm. what special things did I miss? I think you got that one spot on there, Eve. Thank you. This struggle to collect myself wind-blown leaves, this struggle to collect myself, wind-blown leaves. And that's Brian Rickert, Wales Haiku Journal, Autumn 2022. From, from my perspective, and I was looking at this one, I, I really believed that the key go here is the wind-blown leaves, which is autumn. And I saw that it was kind of stirring the sense of feeling of disarray that might be part of the image of the leaves and maybe struggling struggle in a harsh wind to me so it seemed like he was reflecting something that was going on inside of him and he saw the windblown leaves and thought yeah that's how I feel I've got this strong thing going on and I'm struggling to collect myself just like the windblown leaves are kind of scattered to me mm -hmm. it seems like it's definitely a reflection of of where he finds himself in the world uh, mm -hmm. you know the, at that current time there's a little bit more of, of Brian in there, if you look at the mm -hmm. second line, to collect myself. But it's mm -hmm. still not, I don't think it's an intrusive. It doesn't get in the way of the poem at all. What, what do you mm -hmm. think, Eve? I don't, I don't think that it does either. Even though you see that he's part of this, this poem, it's not egregious. You know, you don't get the sense that it's all about him per se. He's observing the windblown leaves. And it's just a reflection of how he's the struggle because um, the struggle, um, depending on how bad the wind is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this could also be the struggle of trying to deal with an umbrella and a coat and a, you know, I mean, there's no oh, yeah. direction you could go with this. <laughs> Ultimately, I, I had, you know, I was anticipating that this was an internal struggle for him. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I think that's clearly what he's trying to bring. But I love that I love that idea you just put in my head with the umbrella, yeah, <laughs> and the coat on, so on. Thanks, Eve. After dinner, heavy snowfall, constant silence. After dinner, heavy snowfall, constant silence. B. A. France Poetry Poetry P Journal two twenty two. So snowfall is obviously the winter Kigo um, and the word heavy changes it up and makes it seem really burdensome. There's typically like a lull after dinner. And so we all experience like fullness after dinner and it makes you kind of lethargic. So that constant silence at the end, in my interpretation kind of brings to a silence that is endless. Um, and so I, I was wondering if the weather was influencing him in this case versus a reflection of his inner weather I'm, not, I'm wondering if you were able to reach out to him and, and get any feedback from him I did r reach out to him now mm -hmm. let's I'll tell you what he he wrote to me he says uh his intention always seemed <laughs> this is funny okay <laughs> he said my intention always seems less important than what arises once I've launched a poem into the world I think that's quite true though isn't it because you, know, you can only be responsible for what you write, not what other people think of it. But then he went on to say he believes he was aiming for something between patience and frustration, mm. a balancing act that we often find ourselves in if we're self-aware at the right moment. 
So it seemed to me, Eve, that perhaps this snowy evening was making BA reflective. And that's, you know, that's the symbolism of the heavy snowfall. So it was, in some ways, this snowfall was influencing his point of view, his frame of mind. Yes, and then the use of heavy and constant both kind of lead you down the path, I think, to to something that is, like he said, frustration. If he had just used snowfall and silence or some other mm. other words, then it it may have been more of a peaceful, but it it feels a little heavy. Yeah, mm-hmm. it does. Those mm-hmm. words do bring yeah. a sort of heavy feel to it, don't they? Uh, mm-hmm. Thanks, BA. Thanks for getting back to me there and making me laugh. We've got to go back to autumn, I think, with our next one, Eve. Autumn leaves raking to and fro his last words autumn leaves raking to and fro his last words hifsa ashraf presence issue 73 and it also won the presence best of issue award obviously an autumn key go like you mentioned and i think of raking the to and fro that could be seen as worry or anxiety i know that for me in any case I get the sense of a ringing of hands, but maybe within the mind because you're thinking too hard over something. And when you have a repetitive task like raking leaves, um, sometimes your mind can wander uh, away from the task and into what's going on inside of you. So I'd be interested to hear what Hifsa had to say on this one um, and see if uh, she had some input that's I think you alluded that might be very different from what our, my interpretation was. Well, I was looking at it, and I think possibly influenced by what I was going through when I first read this poem. To me, this was like an, it was an end of life poem that mm-hmm. Hifsa was reflecting on something, a last conversation she'd, ha- she'd had with someone who was no longer there. But do you know what? I know Hifsa's work and I really should have thought with that in mind because she wrote like... <laughs> And it is very different to where, certainly where I was going with it. She says, the haiku is the manifestation of violence that a woman faces in her life, especially in the patriarchal social setup. It depicts her poor mental health that leaves no choice for her to protest or speak out about it, but to do some sort of catharsis through daily chores. Autumn Mm -hmm. leaves, yeah, I mean, you were spot on there with the the sort of repetitive Mm -hmm. task. Repetitive task. Yeah. Autumn leaves, she says, depicts her life that is so disintegrated, worthless, hopeless, and yeah. annihilated in many ways because of what's being faced by her and her only. His last words particularly shows the words of her abusive husband. Mm. But it can be related to the social setup she lives in where she's the only one who is blamed for a broken marriage or a bad relationship. Mm. It can also reflect the stigmatization she has to face after divorce, separation, or abandonment. I know the haiku can be interpreted in many ways, but she wrote it, keeping the patriarchy in mind. Wow. I know. Makes it look very different. Doesn't it, though? It really Mm -hmm. does. Um, Mm -hmm. But as Mm -hmm. she says, it can be interpreted in so many ways. Right. Yeah, it can. uh, You interpret it different. I interpret it different. Exactly. I mean, the essence of it was where was was right. In the background, those raking the raking the autumn leaves right. that repetitive task was reflecting some inner turmoil some sort of bitterness some you yeah. know something just going on a turning over of something in a mind so i think we got it right whether in in terms of um of slightly the direction off. but we weren't yeah we were slightly off but it's it's quite powerful mm-hmm. when you when you hear that but i think possibly also eve would it be that we have some cultural differences between um where Hifsa is living and where we would be living and perhaps we don't have quite the same patriarchal issues that she might have you know I did I did interpret it as his last words um not being the last words from a you know from oh, someone who was gone uh-huh. from someone who was gone and so I did kind of talk about it being the ringing of the hands, hands but yeah. in the mind, in the mind, you know, mm-hmm. and I know when I've been upset, I clean. You know? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> That's the last thing I do. <laughs> if I'm upset, I do clean because it's a kind of a mindless task. Oh, okay. um, so the raking, that's why it came to me, I guess, the raking to and fro and yeah. thinking 
have a lot in your mind that you're, but she, she's not able to express it. Yeah. And that's, that's sad. Um, and we're going to another one and you're going to be surprised by this one again, Eve, I think. Okay. <laughs> in an empty nest, an acorn. In an empty nest, an acorn. Pippa Phillips, Poetry P Journal, Summer 2021. And I thought this was a sublime haiku from Pippa. Um, I, I could see the quiet outer weather reflected in observing the nest. There's a kind of a casual observation or is it like a reflection of the poet's emotion? It's hard to really read this one, but I, I liked it a lot. I heard the term empty nest. So I had to wonder if this was a reflection of when time, you know, in time when children have left the nest and, and are no longer at home with you, there seemed to be a sadness and in, in what seems to be just a mere observation. Um, but that was how I, how I interpreted it. I'm, I'm curious to see what Pippa responded back on it oh yeah no so I wrote I wrote to Pippa I was very interested in her reply and I'll tell you why in a sec but this was the reply that came back this poem comes from my attempts to imply narrative through haiku in the little mm. story I told myself about this poem the acorn is a changeling or a cuckoo the wrong child has ended up in the nest mm. but still it's supported and will grow into what it is even if it has an unexpected mother and in terms of the emotions, she says the emotional tone she had in mind was the promise of growth in unexpected places, a sadness to the empty nest, but hope to the acorn. Mm. Sometimes, she says, at the lowest point of an emotional valley, renewal comes in unexpected forms. And I wrote back when, when she sent this to me, I wrote back to her and said, I really misinterpreted this poem or at least I interpreted it differently because I don't think you can misinterpret necessarily because I have been through the empty nest mm. situation and I did feel like this was speaking of the, the acorn being hope, but hope for a new life after my lovely children had, had left home. Mm -hmm. and, and to which she replied, bless her. One of the wonderful things about haiku is its ability to avail itself to multiple readings as the reader does half the work. She's a firm believer, she said, in death of the author. Well, this is obviously, she has separated her emotion from the, the you do not see the author in this. Really well done. Home hospice, a few buds left in the daylily patch. Home hospice, a few buds left in the daylily patch. And of course, that was Pat Davis from the Poetry P Journal, Winter 2020. When I first read this, um, you know, of course, Daylily is the key go in my mind. It reflects kind of late spring, early summer. The outer weather is mild. And in contrast to what must be going on with the poet's inner weather, um, as noted, because it's at the home hospice. So I think it leaves the ability to insert your own feelings about what's going on here. And the few buds left to me sounded kind of positive. I've been in home hospice situations and you have a high focus on the person that's in the hospice care. And when there's just a little bit of time left and you're focused there, I guess you leave everything behind. And those few buds to me could be a few days, a few hours, just time. And the daily patch is, is a bright thing. We're obviously two very different people. I think you're a much pos more positive person. Uh, I came to that conclusion as we, we work through the, these poems together, Eve. You're more positive than I am. I I've <laughs> When I first read this, I... I was just oh, so sad. But when I heard you read it, and then when I thought about what you were saying, I, I felt a much more positive flow to it. It hadn't really occurred to me that um, in a home hospice care, you are in a situation where you have got that time mm -hmm. to, sp to spend and to, to dedicate to, to the person coming to the end of their days. And I thought, again, I thought this was a perfect example of what Shiki meant when he said that haiku should be something directly observed 
he said that he felt a poem designed to appeal to the intellect would not appeal to the emotions, whereas something directly observed, something which the reader feels to be truthful, would. And I think this this is, there's no ego in this. Pat is giving us the the poem fairly straight, little few little clues in it to, to help us along the way. But I think it does evoke, certainly evokes and influences the way the reader reads the poem. Yeah, I agree. I love that quote, by the way. That's awesome. I I don't think I'd heard it before. I put the I'll put that in the show notes then and, yeah, <laughs> and, let people, and say where it came from. Um and again I wrote to Pat and Pat I have to say I'm I'm so touched that you wrote back and shared this with us and I think it shows a lot of trust in in us and and everyone who's listening to us today Eve. She wrote it this poem while her husband was in home hospice. Mm. And in those days the last buds in his, her daylily patch were about to bloom. And she felt a closeness to them as my husband, she says, was still fighting to live. Mm -hmm. It was a period of one day at a time, like the life of a day lily. And she hopes that we, her readers, feel this sad connection and maybe a sense that he might or might not have outlived the flowers. Every person and every mm -hmm. flower has its season. Unfortunately, her, her husband did pass in the autumn along with her day lily patch. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was just so so moved not just by the poem but also that Pat shared this, that with us so thank you Pat for, for being so honest with us yes thank you Pat that was wonderful now Eve I was reading these poems like I said as you because mm -hmm. you sent them to me beforehand and I thought I'd, I'd quite like to get involved as well so I've got maybe a couple of poems that I'd like to read to you and so my first one are is deep spring the trees greens start to consolidate deep spring the trees greens start to consolidate and that's by brad bennett from the akitsu quarterly in summer 2022 and i don't know about you eve but when i start to think about spring i mean i'm looking out my window as we're doing this and spring is, is here i think of renewal and hope and mm. everything that's been sort of reposing in nature is coming back to life unless of course a poet is suggesting otherwise and but i in this one i think brad is doing just that to me renewal hope getting his life back together again which i think is particularly true when you read the the lines two and three the trees greens start to consolidate they're consolidating so life is taking mm. off again their planning and seeing their plans come to fruition. And the other thing that occurred to me, Eve, when I read this one aloud, is you can tell that Brad really thinks about euphony because the sound of those two lines, the trees' greens start to consolidate. Just just really lovely. But what did you think? What do you think of this one? The word deep gets you embedded in the poem in the springtime mm -hmm. because it's not the early part of the spring or, you know, you're it, it's spring is, is there. I thought consolidate was such a unique word for a haiku. Yeah. I don't remember ever seeing that word in a haiku before. I'm kind of curious to see if there's others out there that have that use of that word, but it did make me think of bringing things together. Like things are coming together. And I think, and so when you think of spring and things are coming together and now everything is turning green. So it is a very hopeful poem to me too. I wrote to Brad because he's, mm -hmm. he's a haiku pal. He wrote back and said, this poem happened over multiple spring walks on nearby conservation land trails. In the beginning of spring, the young leaves on trees and bushes were exhibiting many shades of green. Then as the season progressed, the varied shades mm -hmm. of green seemed to get closer in hue. And this consolidation mirrored my internal process. The joys and hopes of spring started slowly and then accrued until I found myself in a place of revelry. So I think it's fair to say that the outer weather was reflecting Brad's inner weather here and probably mm -hmm. influencing him too. And he went on to say, it kind of reminds me of another poem that I wrote and I'll read that to you. Spring for a day until one day spring spring for a day 
until one day spring. And that's from Bottle Rockets 31. Mm. I've asked Eve <laughs> to read something to us, something that she wrote. So, Eve, over to you again. How suddenly the butterfly's shadow takes my troubles. How suddenly the butterfly's shadow takes my troubles. Eve Castle, Wales Haiku Journal, summer 2022. I like I like the sounds in that as well, Eve, actually. <laughs> I guess my only commentary, this is a moment, what haiku in most cases are the one moment, reflection of a single moment. And this was for me. And I guess I was doing some of that raking to and fro in my mind as I was walking on a, and it was a paved sidewalk path, walking path. And as I was walking um, in front of me, I saw the shadow of the butterfly in the pavement mm -hmm. and uh, instantly cleared my head. So maybe this one has a little too much ego for what we are trying to accomplish, but it is a true, you know, a true moment that I felt kind of reflected springtime and how it can renew someone, especially when they're, you know, concerned with other things. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely feel the uplift in your spirits in this poem, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, would you say then that this that the the outer weather influenced rather than reflected in this instance? Yes, I, I believe that's what you know, obviously at this moment, um, my inner weather was not in a positive place mm. um, and the spring time butterfly um, lifted my spirits and, and brought me forward to a better place. So yes, definitely it influenced how I was feeling. Yeah. I think you can feel that very, very clearly and possibly you're a bit too close to, to the poem, but I think this is a bit like Brian Ricketts that we read earlier. I mean, he he also mentions himself within the poem, but you're there, but you're fleeting. You're you're not as important. It sounds terribly rude of you to put forgive me, but you're, you, you're, <laughs> I'm you're not, not that important. <laughs> you're not that important yet, really. It's um in this poem anyway. In everyday life, of course, you are absolutely <laughs> most important. But in this this particular poem, you take second place to the butterfly. I think. I think I, I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do. The butterfly's presence, shall we say, yeah. is stronger in the, the poem than than your mm -hmm. actual presence. So mm -hmm. I, I think I think you're doing yourself down there. I don't think there's too much <laughs> ego in this one. <laughs> Good, thank you. Thank <laughs> like you. Steve, that was a that was a great one to to end the presentation with. So now we we should come to a, a conclusion. I'll I'll let you take over. What what do you want people to take away from this? Well, the conclusion, I think, is that seasons often reflect the poet's emotions. Um, and because the poet is writing an authentic piece, they invariably evoke em emotion in their reader. And so trying to also focus on the making sure that uh, what you had talked about earlier, which is controlling the ego in it, we want to see something subtle, seasons and um, weather words and how they reflect your emotions or like in the case of the butterfly poem that I shared how it uplifted or maybe changed your emotions in a different way from where where you started I put together some goals that occurred to me as we were going through this presentation like you said to create something authentic using the season mm -hmm. or the weather ref either which reflects your something you're feeling or as you said i didn't put this on the slide or as you said evokes evokes, evokes. yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think you made a really good point right right at the beginning to manage your ego because i don't think despite what you thought about your own poem i don't think <laughs> any of the poems had the poet too much front and center in it there was always always something more important more important or, st or something stronger in the poem than the, than the poet subtlety is your good yeah. work <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, yeah I think uh, definitely you got to be subtle about this I think I think that was the case with all the poems that you brought to us today that they were all very subtle but they all had some emotional appeal 
you could feel the emotions or mm -hmm. as you said they were reflecting emotions and and it was that sort of an emotional content often done through the the season or the weather and the choice of words i mean the diction oh, yeah you know, we talked about constant and heavy for the yeah. snowfall that definitely uh, you know helped with our interpretation of the emotions that it was reflecting yeah absolutely and then something i wanted to to say is mm -hmm. We can, we can sometimes when we write poetry, we can be very manipulative in the way we, we do things. And again, which is why I came up with it, do this subtly. I don't think we should try and manipulate people's emotions too much. I think mm -hmm. these poems that you, you brought to us today are, are wonderful examples where we're just left to our own devices to, to find the emotion within them. And sometimes, as we illustrated, we've didn't always agree what the emotions that were being reflected or the emotions we were feeling but that's because the poet let us do our own thing I, I agree especially like Pippa's poem about the acorn in the nest leaves it to our interpretation and we get our own emotion from it it could be very different uh, depending on how we interpret what's going on there but leaving it open I guess what you're saying leave it open to interpretation don't try to manipulate the feelings of the reader too much yeah because it does reach a broader audience I think when you do it that way absolutely so Eve yes thank you so much this you're is welcome I enjoyed this the end. did you <laughs> Good, I, was, I was very worried when I, I forced you into to doing this <laughs> I'm happy that I was able to do this today with you thank you Patricia Eve, thank you. Thank you very much for coming along because I know, I don't think until somebody gets involved in doing something like this that they quite know how much work is involved because you would have had to have read quite a few poems to have selected your, your poems. Select the ones that I selected, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm glad I was, a, I was able to find time to do it. Eve Castle, the reluctant podcaster, thank you very much <laughs> for coming along and helping us today with our presentation. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks for helping me get over my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not too bad once you get started. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.